Okay, Professor Upper, you are a co-host now. You can open your mic. Okay, great. Okay, so we are basically ready to start. People will keep pouring in as we go. Um, so uh, I don't think we've met. Can, can, can you see me speaking, Professor yes, Harper? Yes, I see you fine. So I'm Yoni. Yes. So we communicated on email, and it's great to uh, uh, see you now live. Uh, albeit not uh, in person, but you know, in these days, it's as good as it gets. And it's actually, it, it allows for new opportunities I've come to learn. You know, yeah. you don't need to travel across the sea to give a lecture or something like that. That's just wonderful in some, in some ways. So, you know, yeah. squeezing lemonade out of lemons is always nice. Yes. So for everyone, we're going to start. Um, it's really, really a tremendous pleasure and honor for us uh, um, to host Professor William Happer from Princeton University to join us in this meeting of the Israeli Forum for uh, uh, Rational Environmentalism. Um, and the forum, as you know, uh, was constructed as an infrastructure for a more uh, balanced and data-oriented discussions on, on topics of climate, environment, and energy. And Professor Happer is one of the uh, most lucid voices in this field. And, and besides being a, a really a, a one of the Idan and Nephilim, one of the age of what the age of great scientists is one of those, he's really made it to the point of talking about data and science as the basis of making decisions. So it's really a great pleasure. Let me just quickly introduce him. He graduated at Princeton in 1964 and became a professor of, phys of physics at Columbia University in New York. And then uh, um, several years later, in 1980, he went on to become the class of 1909 professor of physics at Princeton University. Um, his, his research focused on optical spectroscopy of atoms and molecules, propagation of radiation in the atmosphere, optical pumping, uh, uh, and many more things. He's the inventor of something called the Sodium Guide Star, which I had the pleasure of reading about in the last few days preparing to this uh, talk. It's really an excellent, a, a beautiful idea. And, and it has to do with shining uh, laser beams into the atmosphere and exciting the sodium atoms in the upper parts of the atmosphere. And, and you know, in order to think about something like that, you need to know a lot about the structure of the atmosphere and the interaction of light and matter, which is in a way the essence of uh, uh, the basics of cl modern climate science. So, this is uh, uh, someone who is probably one of the world's best people to understand these physics. In 1991, he became the director of energy research, which is uh, the, the parallel to Hamad Anarashi in Israel, in the DOE, the US Department of Energy. And he did that until 1993. Since 1976, he's a member of something called Jason which is an advisory group for uh, 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 the US government. And he was the chair of the committee from 1987 to 1990. For the academics among us, Professor Happer has over 200 papers, which garnered over 11,000 citations and an H index of 50, above 50. I hope I can make something like that in my lifetime. Really, it's, it's uh, uh, quite amazing. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the uh, AAS, the NAS, the AA, the NAS, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Science, the American Philosophical Society, and has been awarded the Breuder Prize and the Davidson Germer Prize from the American Physical Society. So really, uh, uh, um, uh, it's really an honor for us to have you here with us, Professor Harper. 
Well, Jonathan, I, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, I, I'm afraid you've taken a lot of our time. I, I, I had to do it. You know, it's, it's about <laughs> the environment. Uh, yes, I know. You, 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 we can see the blush, but but it's, uh, it, I mean, these accolades, uh, you've earned them. Well, thank so, you. Uh, um, um, I think um, we would like to start um, by presenting, you know, what would be a, a, your input on, on, on the following question. We keep on hearing, you know, from the news outlets, from every media out there, politicians, activists, about an imminent climate crisis. What is your take on this? Are we in a climate crisis? Well, of course, we're not in a climate crisis. I mean, the, uh, you know, we, for example, here in Princeton have had an unusually cold spring. And it used to be that people were talking about global warming. And uh, of course, they had to turn it into climate change uh, when the Earth did not warm, as all the computer models predicted. But uh, the reason I'm confident there will be no uh, climate crisis is because, uh, as you say, I, I do know a lot about how the atmosphere works and about how radiation is transferred in the atmosphere. And if you uh, double CO2 concentrations, and we're a long way from doubling it, but if you could, uh, you decrease the cooling radiation to space by just over 1% very small amount. You know, just a drifting cloud does more uh, change of radiation to space than, than doubling CO2. So very few people realize how uh, ineffective CO2 is as a greenhouse gas. You know, it, at its present concentrations, it has uh, pretty well saturated its ability to uh, uh, affect radiation transfer. But, it increases a little bit, but you know, a hundred percent increase of CO two gives only one percent uh, change in radiation to space, one percent decrease. So uh, many of us here are physicists and familiar with simple, uh, uh, you know, back of the uh, envelope calculations, and so I can guarantee the one percent is correct. And we also remember that. The first approximation, warm bodies uh, emit radiation as the fourth power of the absolute temperature, T to the fourth, T being absolute temperature, which is say about, you know, 300 degrees, uh, 280 maybe some. And uh, so the change in the absolute temperature only has to be a quarter of a percent, you know, because you get this T to the fourth uh, multiplier so a quarter of uh, the current absolute temperature of say 300 uh, Kelvin is uh, three quarters of a Kelvin, three quarters of a centigrade. If you double, you know, we're not doubled yet. Now you, you can uh, embellish that with all sorts of feedbacks and uh, you know, we've spent billions of dollars uh, in various countries trying to make this look more frightening than it is, but it's very hard to do it. The uh, you know, the way that they're able to get computer models to predict uh, frightening warming is to add all sorts of, you know, improbable positive feedbacks, you know, and to make sure that any negative feedback is ignored. You know, I, when I was a kid, they taught me Le Chatelier's principle, you know, which is basically that most feedbacks in nature are negative. <laughs> And so here we have a, a community that says all feedbacks and climate are positive, you know, a, a very unusual system. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, just on first principles, it, it's extremely improbable that CO2 makes much difference to temperature. It, it probably warms a little bit, but not very much. But on top of that, you know, CO2 is uh, really the molecule of life. You know, we're made of carbon. I, you know, I'm just astonished when people talk about carbon pollution. Who are they talking about? Are they talking about me? You know, I'm made of carbon mostly. I, the, uh, at least by weight, carbon is the second, you know, the largest constituent of our bodies. Uh, oxygen is a little more because there's so much water, you know, so most of your weight is from water, but after that, it's carbon. And um, 
you know, we breathe out about two pounds of carbon a day. I, I, I'm sorry, I lift what, I, what is that in kilograms? It, you know, it's, it's a, uh, about a kilogram a day, <laughs> okay. And uh, so is it, you know, there are eight billion people in the, <laughs> in the world. So they eight billion kilograms a day of just people being alive. You know, it seems to me it's very dangerous to say that, you know, that these people are breathing pollution, you know, out their, <laughs> out their mouths, you know, it, it's crazy. Um, so it, anyway, uh, it, it's very clear that uh, the climate is going to do what it wants to do. Climate has always changed. It, you know, I often think about, you know, the uh, famine in the land of Canaan that, uh, you know, took the, uh, you know, Abraham and his children to, his, to Egypt, you know, that was climate change. That was a long time ago. It, I, I doubt it had anything to do with burning coal and fossil fuel. Uh, Probably not, it, indeed. You know, but, but the hi history is replete with climate change and uh, it, uh, it's going to continue to change. There's nothing we can do about it. We live in this very complicated world with uh, two major fluids, the oceans and the atmosphere with uh, all the turbulence and uh, other complicated physics that goes with that. And, and, you know, convective transport of heat from the equators equatorial regions to the poles and uh, with radiative uh, loss of heat to space and a radiative gain from the sun. So uh, to, to think that 1% change in that from doubling CO2 is going to make a big difference is just, uh, it's insanity to me. You know, I, I don't know how people get away with claiming that. Uh, now, I think one of our problems is that uh, Everyone uh, wants a good environment. I, I certainly want a good environment. I'm sure all of us on this call want a good environment. And uh, so the uh, alarmists have managed to conflate, you know, alarm over carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases with alarm over the environment. You know, if, you, if you're not alarmed like they are about carbon dioxide, you're against a clean environment. So somehow we have to push back against that, that, uh, every one of us is a environmentalist in the real sense of the word, that we want a, a good environment, a clean environment, an improved environment if possible. Uh, and uh, that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, limiting the emissions of carbon dioxide or methane or any of the other things that they fret about. So uh, I don't know quite how to do that because the media has been completely hijacked by a generation of alarmist journalists. You know, they go to school, they learn how to write alarmist papers and they go to work for the New York Times or the Washington Post. I don't know, maybe it's better in Israel, but it's not very good in this country. Not by much, <laughs> not by much. No, okay. So anyway, that, uh, that's, that's a long-winded answer uh, to your question, is there a, uh, climate crisis? And the answer is no, there's no climate crisis. There won't be a climate crisis. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, um, following up on that, and, and since you have also the political uh, experience, um, I would like to ask, this is a question that came uh, uh, from one of our listeners, one of our uh, participants. So, can you tell us about the politics behind the research of climate change as it emerged from your experiments in DOE? I mean, how, how did the process become so skewed towards a, a CO2 as the main driver? Can you reflect well, on that? Well, you know, this really got its start in, in the 70s uh, when, um, you know, people like the Club of Rome were uh, uh, making dire forecasts about what would happen to the future of the earth, you know, mostly because of humans, you know, they regarded humans as uh, uh, fundamentally uh, uh, harmful to earth, you know, the earth would be a better place with no humans on it, according to them. And uh, back in the 70s, the, uh, the problem was supposedly uh, 
you know, global cooling, you know, I remember that time. It really was getting cold. I lived in New York and I looked out on the Hudson River and <clears throat> every winter there was more ice floating down the river. You could practically walk across to New Jersey on, you know, chunks of ice in, in the 70s. But then, you know, uh, climate as it always did started to change. It started to warm instead of to cool. And um, so they were thrashing around with some, looking for some environmental threat. And they found a few, for example, in the US, there was acid rain, you know, so there was a huge uh, <clears throat> uh, flurry of activity that went on for about a decade worrying about acid rain. Basically, it meant sulfur from coal plants. And indeed, that does make the rain uh, somewhat acid. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, we don't burn it nearly as much high sulfur coal as we used to. And uh, so the rain is a little bit less acid, but it's still acid. They, they just got tired of that threat. And then they moved on to CO2, which is you know, much more promising because that's really the key to life. You know, if you can control CO2, as I said, we all breathe CO2. Plants live on CO2. The, yeah. You've got the world by its throat then. And uh, <laughs> so um, that was already, I think, pretty clear in the minds of the... Uh, uh, the devious environmentalists or the people using environmentalism to uh, gain control uh, in the in the 80s, you know, before I came to the Department of Energy. And it was clearly uh, very, very, uh, very much in vogue by 1990. And, uh, you know, there was the Rio conference that uh, Bush... Uh, Senior went to, I worked for Bush Senior at that time, and uh, he wanted the US to look virtuous. And so we signed up to all sorts of uh, silly things there that probably made the environment worse. And, um, but it made, you know, Mr. Bush feel good. And, um, and then there, were, there was a temporary scare on, on uh, ozone and, uh, so we signed the Montreal Protocol but in the late 80s, and uh, that encouraged the, uh, uh, the control freaks in environment that, you know, they succeeded in, in that particular uh, campaign. And it, it was much like the campaigns today. There was a, a little bit of truth to it, but mostly it was nonsense. And uh, so, uh, you know, by the 90s, uh, mid 90s, uh, CO2 was the key tool to uh, gain control. And uh, it remains that way today. And uh, the reason they get away with it is because of um, very poor science literacy. Uh, it's probably, probably in Israel, you have more science literacy than we do in the United States. But you know, most American politicians and businessmen and uh, others um, really didn't like science very much when they were in school and, you know, they didn't get good grades in it. And so <laughs> they come away for the rest of their life with a grudge against uh, science. And it is done by weird people who do strange things and uh, best left alone. And if they tell you something, well, just assume that so. So the ability to think, uh, independently on technical topics is, is not very widespread in our country. So, you know, I, I remember once testifying in Congress about CO2 and one of the uh, congressmen asked me, uh, well, Dr. Happer, you, you say CO2 is, is, is uh, not harmful, that it's actually good. Does that mean I can uh, lock myself in my garage and turn on my automobile engine and, and leave it running and I'll be just fine. And I, I tried to explain to the congressman, he, he was actually a nice guy. He was uh, just completely ignorant. He didn't know the difference between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And he wasn't trying to be devious. He was just stupid. Right? He had had a bad education. He was a black guy from, right. from uh, Missouri. And so he uh, had had bad schools all his life. And so he really didn't know. And so I think that's true of, you know, of the majority of the people who are causing trouble, the great herds of, you know, of sheep, uh, 
they believe in this stuff, you know, they, they think there really is a threat and uh, they are, are so weak in technical knowledge that it's difficult to ex explain to them that they're being deceived. <laughs> so that, that's a big problem we, we face. I think all over the world, people face that problem. Yeah. I'm, I'm, go I'm going to ask you later, how do you think we can try and solve this problem? But I st I'm still interested in, in, in this skewness. I mean, if you look, and this is a question that came up a lot in the discussions prior to the meeting, because when we published this meeting, many, many people say, I mean, many people said, oh, he's not a, a real climate scientist and he's not publishing his papers in peer review, and 97% of the climate scientists think that he is wrong. So I would say, I would ask you two questions here. First, um, why won't you publish in, in a, a climate journals? And, and I have to say prior, before that, that I'm cheating a little bit because I read the uh, referee report that you sent Eli Miron, and it was amazing to me. But but I want you to share this story with, with uh, the listeners. And the second part of this question is, how come the climate science community, whatever that means, has become so skewed? I mean, has become so single-minded into this... A, a, a theory of carbon dioxide of, 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 and, and global warming. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll try and remember all of the questions. There were several here, <laughs> but just starting, yeah. uh, let me start with the 90% of climate scientists agree that climate science is important. That's also true of astrology, you know, and uh, just because 97% of astrologists say you should read your horoscope every day doesn't mean that uh, if you question them, you know, you're, you're crazy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't mind the astrologers. If you want to get a horoscope, that's perfectly okay with me, but I don't want the government telling me that I have to buy a horoscope every day. <laughs> so uh, there are many examples in history where, you know, uh, scientific communities have been... Uh, have had a strong consensus that was completely wrong. You know, I, I'll mention just a few, uh, a fairly recent one, and uh, it's uh, happened during my lifetime, was the discovery that uh, stomach ulcers, for the most part, are, are an infectious disease. You get it from Halobacter uh, uh, and uh, pylori. And when I was a young man, my father had ulcers and uh, he took, you know, chalk every day and uh, he thought it was due to stress and, you know, the chalk didn't help very much. It never occurred to him to take antibiotics, right? But it, it was uh, widely believed that uh, this was a stress disease. It had nothing to do with an infection. And these Australian doctors who eventually proved that it was mostly infectious, uh, had a very hard time, you know, they were ridiculed, they, they were uh, smeared, you know, by the medical establishment, especially the gastroenterologist, you know, whose, uh, whose livelihood was threatened by this new theory because it's very cheap, you know, to administer a few antibiotics and completely cure your ulcers, right? Whereas if you can keep them going for year after year after year, you know, it's good income stream. So that, Another uh, example is, um, you know, the theory of continental drift. Uh, this is an interesting one because it had no political ramifications, but uh, Alfred Wegener, who proposed it in the 20s, uh, was uh, roundly ridiculed and, and rejected, especially in America. You know, American geologists, for some reason, were uh, violently opposed to the idea of continental drift. You know, looking back, it's hard to understand, but that theory was very much in vogue when I was a graduate student. You know, it was uh, still considered risky to, uh, if you were an uh, academic, to say, well, maybe there's something to continental drift, you know. But when finally the, uh, you know, the data on seafloor magnetism began to be public, it was completely obvious that, you know, the seafloor was spreading and therefore the continents had to drift. 
So that, that was a bit of evidence that was not available to Wegener, but he was basically right. He had lots of other evidence that was equally convincing, you know, fossils on South America and, and uh, South Africa and India, you know, identical at the places where these jigsaw puzzle continents would fit together. So it, it was a good theory and it, it was just human stupidity and groupthink again that stopped it. Uh, I mentioned talking to Ellie yesterday that in our country in the late 18, 1800s, early 1900s, we had this uh, pernicious uh, eugenics movement, which um, uh, basically held that, you know, the master race was the Anglo-Saxons, you know, and uh, we were degrading the American race by letting in all these Italians and Eastern Europeans and Chinese and stuff like this. It was complete nonsense. You know, it, it was, uh, fortunately we were a democracy, so it didn't matter that much. Although we, we did pass laws that allowed uh, states to sterilize under undesirable people, you know, which was uh, outrageous. And uh, that didn't stop until the seventies, you know, it took a long time to stop it. But uh, again, Certainly in the 1920s, uh, 1930s, every little town in America had a eugenic society and the best people of the town belonged to it. They would have monthly meetings with tea and cookies and talk about improving the race. And it was all based on lies. <laughs> so uh, uh, the idea that you that a majority is right is, is not true. You, you remember the famous... Uh, comment that Einstein made when uh, this paper, you know, 100 author and gegen Einstein, uh, 100 authors against Einstein was published, he said, well, you know, if I were wrong, it would only take one author to prove that I'm wrong. <laughs> so you don't decide yes. whether something is right or wrong in science on the basis of consensus. You decide on the basis of, does it agree with experiment <laughs> and observations? And if it doesn't, it's wrong. And, and that's certainly true of climate models. They don't agree. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, I, I guess this, that was, um, there was a third part of the question. Oh, why don't I publish? Well, you know, I, I am a serious scientist and uh, uh, oh, yeah. I, ha I have published a lot and uh, I'm still working on uh, physics related to uh, the atmosphere and radiation transfer. That's where I'm most comfortable. And I have tried several times to publish uh, some very good papers, in my opinion, important papers on uh, radiation transport. That, that's why I know that, you know, doubling CO2 only causes 1% change because I've worked through that personally myself. <laughs> and um, so we submitted, I, I've been doing this work with a Canadian colleague, William Van Weingarten at uh, York University in Canada. And we've desperately tried to publish uh, some nice papers. I'll be glad to send you copies. They're on archive now, sort of, sort of the Sami Stat, you know, like the Soviet Union, but it is just like the Soviet Union. You cannot publish a paper now that is, uh, uh, that uh, questions the narrative that there is a climate crisis, you know, so it's considered very, very poor form to point out that, you know, doubling CO2 makes only 1% change in, in radiation to space. You're not supposed to say that in public. And, you know, it's like uh, exposing yourself, you know, and so, so I, it's not for lack of trying that uh, we haven't published. And um, I think the community would be a lot, uh, they benefit from seeing uh, some of the work we've done, but the, uh, it's getting a lot of attention anyway through Sami's dot. So I'm not all that concerned about it. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, as, a, um, as someone who tries to publish a lot, I mean, it's really amazing. I mean, to, to get a, a, a reviewer right, you know, writing without hesitations, you deviating from the narrative and therefore this should not be published. Yeah. This is basically what you wrote in that review. It's, it's I mean, we, we will publish this on our website because it's, it's simply unbelievable. Yeah. And it's a live demonstration of how real science is pushed aside towards, you know, what, what I can only call as propaganda. 
Mm -hmm. And and I, I would like to ask you now, before we go on for a few questions from the participants. So we hear that the science is certain. Now it's clearly, I mean, and and the, the American Physical Society wrote, you know, quite infamous in in, in infamously that the evidence for CO2 uh, uh, driven global warming is incontrovertible. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the statement, the, the claim that science is settled? I mean, how do you approach well, such a, such yeah, a statement? Most of us on this call uh, are either scientists or, or closely uh, connected with science. And, you know, all of us know that science is never settled. You know, science is constantly changing and we are always learning more about it. And, um, you know, we talked about Einstein a minute ago and, uh, you know, who would have thought, you know, in 1900 that the basic ideas that Newton worked on, which were so spectacularly successful, were, were actually uh, only a limiting, limiting case of, of a much more correct theory of the world, which we now understand very, very well. But, uh, you know, the speed of light is constant, you know, it, inertial frames, you know, you get these strange transformations, not just with space, but with time too, you know, and, and so all that was extremely surprising, extremely controversial. That's why there were the hundred authors against Einstein, you know, <laughs> because it just was so outrageous, you know, but it was true, you know, and it, it was true not because a hundred people agreed, it was because experiment after experiment after experiment showed that what you predict is what you observe. And, um, so uh, I, I've sort of, <laughs> I've lost the thread now of, of what we were, uh, 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 what, yeah, what science is settled. The science is settled, yes. Yeah. Okay. The, so anyway, the, 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 the main point is science is never settled, it's always changing. And it, it, uh, it is not settled by consensus at all. You know, the idea that everybody agrees and therefore something is right. That, that's never been true it, uh, in the past. It's not true today. And uh, I, I think part of the problem with say the American Physical Society, which I, I'm a still a member of, although it embarrasses me. And I'm also embarrassed by the Academy of Science, which I'm also a member of, you know, it's these, these organizations get, uh, especially the management, you know, if you're having a hard time uh, really being creative in your field of science, um, you know, there's this, uh, uh, there, there's this uh, possibility of going into science administration. And that's a lot easier, you know, you're not competing against lots of other people who are just as bright or even brighter than you are. And so the, these societies get filled up with uh, burnt out people uh, who from real science and, and uh, you know, they, uh, they l latch on to policy and administration as a, a means for uh, self-esteem, you know, the thing that makes them feel important. And since they, it's a lot of hard work to really dig into the details of an issue like climate, we've already talked about how complicated it is with fluid and radiation and all of that. They don't even try and, and they simply look around and say, look, everybody agrees with this. So it must be true, we agree, we agree with it too. But that, that's an administrator's argument. That, that's a, a, a apparatchik's argument. It's not a real science argument. And uh, yeah, we, you all understand this. I mean, I, I'm talking to the choir, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, so uh, um, we have some questions that has been posed here. Um, so one question from Asaf is, do you see, I mean, you agree, you seem to agree that the temperatures are rising and does this not pose some threat to human welfare? And, and in that context also, what do you think will be the source of energy that we're going to use. Are we going to make the transfer to renewable energies or uh, keep using fossil fuels or maybe some form of nuclear fusion or something like that? So these are two co uh, coalesced questions. 
Okay, well, let, let me first talk about the, the first one, which is the temperature rise. I think everybody should be aware that we're, we're coming out of the little ice age that, uh, you know, made much of the Northern Hemisphere and parts of the South too much colder in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. There were several centuries where the Earth was considerably colder than it had been in the year 1000. So uh, the mo a good fraction of the warming that we've experienced is uh, probably the natural recovery from the Little Ice Age. I already mentioned that, you know, if you, uh, if you look at the details of the physics, it's really hard to see how even doubling CO2 would make as much as a degree of warming. And we've seen more warming than that. And much of that warming happened before there was any increase in CO2. And so it's really hard to understand why uh, the first hundred years of warming, which is the same as the second hundred years, the first hundred years was natural and the second year, hundred years is all CO2 when they're both the same warming. You know, it's, it's just completely illogical. So I, I don't think that the amount of warming that we're seeing is uh, at all threatening. I think it's good for most people, uh, at least if you live in temperate parts of the world, uh, like New Jersey, um, a few extra days of growing season is a big help. You know, you can plant your garden a little bit earlier. The frost doesn't kill your garden quite as early in the fall. And that's all you're going to get from the warming that we're seeing now. Uh, and on top of that, there are all these enormous benefits from uh, more CO2 that you, you yourself know quite a bit about. And uh, that photosynthetic uh, life uh, does much better if you double or even quadruple CO2. And uh, over most of geological history, CO2 levels have been four or five, even 10 times what they are now. And, and life flourished. So there's no, no sign that uh, it would be any problem. The other thing about temperature is that um, the increases almost certainly will be mostly at high latitudes, you know, high in the northern hemisphere, uh, uh, high in the southern hemisphere, or whatever, low in the southern hemisphere, whatever the right word is. And um, there's not going to be much change in the temperature uh, in the tropics. Uh, so, uh, and all models predict that because you get more heat transfer north and south. And uh, so where the temperature rises is where it will do the most good. Uh, I mean, it's really true that uh, there were Norse farmers in Greenland who were growing crops that you can't grow there today in the, in the year 1000. You know, they grew things like barley. They, they probably were big fans of beer. That's why they grew barley. But you can't grow barley in Greenland today. And uh, uh, so I, I don't see any, any downside from more CO2. All I see is, is uh, good things. Now, let, let me turn to the second uh, part of the question, which where, where do we get our energy? Well, certainly for the next 50 years, uh, we're going to continue getting energy from fossil fuels. Uh, it's just not possible to make that change very quickly, no matter what politicians think they're going to do. It, it won't happen because, um, you know, we've tried that uh, at various parts of the world, Germany with their energy and uh, Texas with their windmills and uh, South Australia with windmills. Uh, once you get more than a few, say 10 or 20% of uh, renewable power, uh, uh, you just can't sustain the electrical grid. And so that's really the only uh, place where renewables can directly help because you can't put a windmill on your airplane or your <laughs> automobile. And, uh, there you have to have some kind of a fuel uh, that you can carry with you. Um, so sooner or later though, uh, I, I think it'll be a lot, it'll, be a long, long time, but sooner or later, fossil fuel will get so scarce that uh, we'll need something else. I, I don't think that will be in the lifetime of my grandchildren even, but, but sooner or later it will happen. And so when I was at Department of Energy, I was always glad to support uh, work, work on alternate energy. For example, we spent a lot of money on controlled fusion. You know, it's a problem that 
still has not been solved. Uh, it's much harder than people originally thought. But uh, I don't think that's any reason to give up. In fact, uh, when people would ask me, why are you dumping money into fusion when I was responsible for the budget, I said, well, I, it's in hopes that uh, some bright young graduate student, you know, who has a new idea that, you know, nobody thought of before. And uh, that's happened before in uh, science and it's solved seemingly unsolvable problems, but it doesn't happen if you don't have the bright students around who are thinking about the problem. So I, I think it's essential to keep the brightest kids we can find working on these very hard problems. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely con convinced that one of them will solve it one of these days. I, I don't think it will be because of some initiative of the government. It will be because of some bright idea that comes out of nowhere. Uh, but, but you have to make sure you have the people who have the bright ideas or it won't happen. Uh, so fusion would be uh, essentially solve the problem for, for indefinite time. Uh, fusion, I think, has, uh, uh, you know, it, it clearly works. Uh, it's in trouble now for two reasons. One is a political reason that uh, it's associated with uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, you know, and that's a reasonable concern. I don't, I don't know whether, I'm not sure whether what we're doing is the right way to address it, but uh, I understand the concern. And the other is uh, the cost, you know, it's so expensive to build a few fission reactors now in the United States that uh, any company that would use their investors' money to put up a, uh, fission plant, a nuclear plant, rather than a combined cycle gas turbine. They're, they're crazy, you know, they should be put in jail for, you know, defrauding their investors. And so, so that, that's a problem, again, that I think could be solved, but uh, it means that uh, we need to take a fresh look at uh, fission power and, and try to do a better job on it on our second try than we originally did. The French, I think, did a pretty good job. They uh, they uh, focus early on a standard reactor design. Uh, they learn from uh, uh, doing it. Uh, they didn't experiment too much so that uh, they managed to beat all the mistakes out of, uh, uh, out of reactor design. You know, the, one of my friends once told me a good engineer, he said, you know, the first law of engineering is turn her on and see why she don't work and uh, turn her on and see why she don't work. And that's true, you know, when, when you first design something, you always forget something and, and you have to fix it. And then, then it works a little better and a little better. And um, so, uh, but if every new design, if every time it's a new design, you never get to fix it, right? <laughs> so it, it just always has problems. And uh, so the French uh, understood that. And, and I think that's why their nuclear program works so well. Uh, so, uh, other sources, you know, I, I, um, I don't see a, a great future right now for wind and solar the, uh, as, they're, as they're currently um, available. You know, they, uh, for example, you know, everybody knows the sun sets every night, so solar has this cyclical problem that maybe you could handle, but it's a very difficult problem. And uh, wind is erratic, you know, uh, the wind does blow at night, but it doesn't blow every night, it doesn't blow every day. And so there's this, uh, uh, this unreliability of, of the renewables. And, uh, and finally, there, there's the whole issue of fuel. You know, if you're gonna fly a jet plane, it almost has to fly on fuel. You know, you can't fly it on batteries, they're too heavy. And, uh, mm. So uh, if we run out of fossil fuels, I, I'm quite confident that at some point we will have to synthesize uh, probably hydrocarbons. It's hard, hard to beat a hydrocarbon as a fuel because uh, you know, very high energy density when you burn it with oxygen and um, it's easily transportable. You don't need cryogenics and uh, you can tailor the length of the hydrocarbon to get just the right vapor pressure you want and so so you, and you could synthesize those if the energy were abundant enough and cheap enough. Uh, 
all you need is water and limestone and uh, you can make as much fuel as you like. Uh, and at the same time, it, it would be carbon neutral because you know when you use the limestone to get carbon, you, uh, you le you're left with this slate lime which absorbs CO2 from the air. You know? So it, it would be pretty much a closed cycle with respect to CO2 from the air. That's pretty amazing. Uh, um, so in line with this, we're going for a question from Ze'ev, which is a bit technical, but your expertise is going to be used here. I hope that's okay. So sure. you mentioned a lot in your talks and, and, and also here that, that the infrared absorption of CO2 in the atmosphere is not linear with its concentration, but rather as you increase it, the, the, uh, satur it approaches saturation. Can you expand on the physical mechanism in, in a simple way? Because this is something I think would also be very, very useful for a, a, um, us as promoters of this point. Yeah. Because it's very hard for me to, to explain this. Uh, it's a kind of gentle point. I was wondering, can you explain it and maybe give some, no, yeah, let, uh, let, let uh, me try, yeah. let me try. Um, many people don't really understand how the greenhouse effect works. You know, uh, certainly John Kerry doesn't understand it. But the, uh, uh, if you look down at Earth from outer space, uh, say from one of our geosynchronous satellites, um, much of the radiation you see coming up to the satellite does not come from the surface at all. It's not radiation that's been attenuated by the surface. It's radiation that has been emitted by water vapor or by cloud tops or, or by CO2 at a high altitudes. So most of the radiation from CO2 is coming from the lower stratosphere, you know, from say 10 kilometers to 20 kilometers uh, in altitude where the temperature is almost constant. And so the, you know, it, it, so the lower stratosphere is acting more or less like a black body at 220 Kelvin. Yeah, I, 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 this is a sort of technical uh, discussion, mm -hmm. but that, that's approximately what it is. Next time you take a, about, a jet flight. About you, minus 50, yeah. About minus 50. For the, we count zero. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that, next time you ta uh, take a jet flight, you know, they sometimes m monitor the outside temperature and you'll notice that it, it settles down at about minus 50. You know, if you take a long boring flight from Israel to New York or somewhere else and, it, and the plane happens to have the temperature, watch it, it's very interesting, you'll learn a lot. So that, it's really that temperature that, that determines how much energy goes out into space. It's not the amount of CO2. You know, you, it's already black. And so you can't get things any blacker than they already are. If they, so the, the lower stratosphere is black with CO2. So the only way CO2 can really make much difference is that the, the edges of its absorption band uh, are so weak that they occur in the lower part of the atmosphere, in the stratosphere where it's a bit warmer. So uh, if you look at the CO2 absorption band uh, and on one side and on the other side, there's a tiny bit of radiation going up that's more intense than the part in the middle that's due to the stratosphere. And if you add CO2, that radiation emission level uh, rises up toward the stratosphere and it gets colder and so you radiate a little bit less radiation. So the, the reason radiation from CO2 goes down when you double CO2 is because the radiating CO2 at the edges of that band are getting just a little bit colder and therefore they're not as efficient radiators to space as uh, they used to be when they were down, you know, lower in the atmosphere where it was warm. So uh, a lot of people also don't realize the, the extreme importance of the temperature profile of the atmosphere. You know, the uh, greenhouse warming is entirely due to the fact that the uh, temperature decreases as you go up. It's easy to show, uh, it's almost elementary physics, that if the atmosphere were isothermal, the, the temperature were the same at the surface as at the top of the atmosphere, you could add all the CO2 you want. It would make no difference at all 
to the radiation to space. So the, the, the reason CO2 makes a difference is because the atmosphere is not isothermal, that, that it, it's cooling rapidly as you go up with, you know, in altitude. And if, if it were the opposite, for example, if, if the uh, atmospheric temperature uh, would go up, like you have in a temperature inversion over South Pole, for example, temperature goes up as you go up in altitude, their CO2 has a negative greenhouse effect. You know, if you add CO2, you, you put more, <laughs> you know, radiation to space. So uh, the, the poles of the earth actually is where CO2 is having the opposite effect than it does over most of the rest of the earth, where, where it decreases radiation to space. But over the poles, it increases radiation to space because of the, the change in the temperature profile over the poles. So, uh, People who say that this is uh, trivial, that you can learn about it in kindergarten, it, it just shows that they don't really understand anything about it. You know, certainly Mr. Carey doesn't know the first thing about it. And, and many other prominent people who pretend they know a lot about it don't, don't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I don't know, the experimentalists who uh, are in the audience, if you've ever used a, uh, disappearing filament, uh, uh, you know, pyrometer to measure temperature. There's a lot of good physics related to global warming there. And, and uh, I won't say any more, but in the hopes that someone has done that, you know, think about that and its relationship to, <laughs> uh, to greenhouse effect and uh, you'll understand a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Zev. I hope uh, uh, this answers the question. This was to me, this was quite illuminating, and it's 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 a, a beautiful way to think about this, and and I think this is an extremely uh, uh, important point. Um, Idan, do you want to ask? I have a list of more questions, but Idan wants to ask a question, so I will give him the honor. Idan. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Professor Hopper. Yes. It's a great honor. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the, the crisis of the integrity of science. And you mentioned the, a lot of the reasons for this uh, uh, confusion about, about the climate crisis is sloppy science and science illiteracy. I wanted to ask, is there something even more sinister behind this uh, this crisis and the way it is projected to the public? Um, is science being weaponized by some forces who are trying to promote a grand political, uh, social economic agenda and are using science as a pretext for it? Um, and I, I, want, I want just to mention, we've been warned that this can happen with science. In, in the, the, the farewell speech by, by President Eisenhower, he was talking about the danger of, of big science and government, that government is funding the scientists and the scientists will just sign off on uh, any big agenda that the politicians want to promote. And this is a danger. And is, is this what we are seeing here with the climate science? I mean, it's not only sloppy science, it's uh, we've seen the, the, the changing of the temperature records. We've seen the hockey stick manufactured. Yeah. We've seen fraud in, in this debate and it went into the UN reports. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we know about Professor Michael Mann who was behind the hockey stick and when people were speaking against what he did and he will not release his, his, his data, he attacked people with defamation lawsuits and this is all becoming um, um, uh, around cancel culture and bullying. And the scientific uh, process is not exactly working here because there is no real debate. Is one side who can talk and one side who is not allowed to talk. Um, I wanted to ask, is this truly a scientific debate or are we playing in a different game, different rules? And is the way out to add some more, some more quality control to science because apparently we cannot, 
completely trust what is coming out of the scientific institutions, as you said. Well, uh, Dan, thank you. I, I, I agree with uh, the points you made. I mean, Eisenhower was very prescient. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure that uh, that was actually written by my old Columbia friend, I. I. Robbie, who was uh, a close friend of Eisenhower. Uh, but it, because it sounds like what he always used to say to me, but it, it, it's very true that um, uh, science, uh, uh, there's the old saying, uh, you know, power corrupts. And if it doesn't matter whether you're a scientist or a politician or anyone else, if you have too much power, you eventually become corrupt. And I, I think that has happened to some extent in, uh, in climate. There are good people still doing work in climate. I, I have particular admiration for the people who do measurements. For example, the uh, people who build satellite instruments to measure various things remotely from space or the people who build uh, these floating buoys, you know, to measure ocean temperatures and salinity and uh, currents. Um, that's expensive, it's hard to maintain it. And I, I used to worry a lot about that when I was uh, uh, the head of research at the Department of uh, Energy. I, I, I wanted to put more money into these instrumental measurements and less money into computer models. Uh, but uh, uh, the, your, your basic question is, is there some greater dark force driving this out there? Uh, uh, I, I don't think there's anything hidden. It, it's pretty clear that uh, there are lots of politicians who love uh, alarmism over global warming because it gives them more power, you know, so that they don't hide that, you know, they <laughs> it's quite transparent. Uh, our, our scientific community, unfortunately, uh, needs money to do research. And uh, so, in the area of climate, at least in the United States, it's been difficult to get money unless you're willing to publish something that at least can be, uh, can seem to be alarming about the climate. And uh, so that's been corrupting. Uh, the, uh, another problem we have is that um, many people uh, need a, a cause that they can relate to that, um, is greater than themselves. People used to uh, get that from organized religion, you know, uh, and less and less people uh, find that uh, uh, solace in religion and, and they feel this emptiness. They, they is, all my life is, is there's nothing to my life if I, I can't do something important. So one thing you can do that's important is to save the planet. And so they've been misled into thinking that joining this cult is actually doing something good, you know, for the planet or for mankind. In fact, it's not doing that at all. It's, uh, I often say, and I think it's true, this is much like the medieval crusades, you know, that uh, you had, you know, European children even uh, trying to <laughs> march to, Palestine, you know, to save the holy city or whatever, you know, it was all nonsense. And uh, they, uh, it was very tragic, you know, most of them never came home. Uh, but it, it was motivated by the same human desire to do something that is worthwhile and relevant, you know, to make your life worth living. And so we, I think one way to uh, address that is, is to, give people something they really can do that it is worthwhile, that will make a difference and actually make things better rather than make things worse. And I'm not quite sure how to do that, but that was the idea, I think, of John Kennedy's Peace Corps. You know, the fundamental idea was good, that you, you give something uh, constructive and uh, really useful for young people to do so that uh, uh, they can feel good about themselves. And uh, so maybe finding something like that out would you know, would help. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe we, need, we should restore something like a Peace Corps and, and that would help. Uh, as for what will stop it, you know, I, I, it may be that's what needed is, uh, what's needed is some kind of c catastrophe that we let some states or country go all the way, you know, let, uh, 
you know, let California uh, completely ban automobiles, you know, fossil fuels, um, and uh, show the world what happens, you know. And uh, as long as it's done at a small community, a small part of the human uh, family, uh, it won't do too much damage. You know, if we do it over the whole world at once, you know, then the whole world suffers. But if it's one small part, one small country or state, then it won't be so bad and, and it will cure people a little bit like a vaccination, you know, for COVID or, or, <laughs> or a mild case, you know. So anyway, I, I, I can't add very much more to this. You uh, clearly understand it at, at least as well as I do. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think the main thing is not to give up, you know, never give up. <laughs> I just must I, I just must add for, for for the people who are watching a great joke you had in one of your lectures that I saw on YouTube regarding uh, the, the the temperature record and talking about past the past uh, of, of the temperature record and he said it's like in the Soviet Union they used to say that the the most difficult thing to predict is the past yes, you don't right. know what you are allowed to say and what you're not allowed that's to say. right yeah Yeah. yeah, changing the past now to basically to yeah, to yeah, talk. yeah. No, it's outrageous what they've done to the uh, to the historical records, uh, temperature, and uh, some of the other things. So, so, so this was actually a, a question that raised by a, a, our own member of the forum, Professor Micha Klein, who wanted to ask if you have something to say about the correction on, on data records, on temperature records, which is coming uh, um, from uh, places which are funded by the government, places like NASA and, and NOAA and, and things like that. And I wondered if you have something to say about that. Well, uh, I think that it's very worrisome if you look at our US records, uh, You know, 20 years ago, it was very clear that uh, the warmest period of the past century had been the uh, Dust Bowl era, you know, in the 30s. There was one record after another that had been uh, broken during that time. And uh, if you look at U.S. records now, that's disappeared, you know. We, <laughs> so uh, they every year they adjust the Dust Bowl period down another tiny fraction of a degree. So you don't notice it in one year, but next year it's down again and down again. And now it's, it's, it's practically nothing happened in the 30s if you look at our current records. And that's happened also in Australia. You know, there's, it's well documented that the uh, uh, temperature record uh, in Australia has changed enormously. And, and the changes are always in the same direction to make the past look cooler and if possible to make the recent past look warmer. So that uh, if you plot versus time, there's a rapidly increasing temperature when if you look at the raw data, it's not there at all. Uh, so uh, this used to happen in the Soviet Union. It was uh, worst of all in, uh, in biology. You know, there was this long period in the Soviet Union, which was dominated by Lysenko. And uh, Lysenko was, um, you know, uh, not very well educated agricultural extension agent from down near Odessa in Ukraine. And uh, so he helped farmers know when to plant their seeds, but he came up with this idea that you could vernalize seeds, that was the word. And so you could, uh, you know, take a sack of, uh, you know, wheat and bury it under the ground all winter and then uh, it would grow better the next year. And uh, in fact, it would grow further north. You could get it to grow, you know, where wheat, doesn't normally grow. And, and that was the start of it. And um, then it, it was followed by all sorts of amazing things. You know, there was inheritance of acquired characteristics and uh, there was re rejection of the genetic theory. And, you know, by 1940, you could be uh, fired from your job. You know, if you talked about uh, Mendelian genetics, you know, <laughs> smooth peas and, and wrinkled peas, all of that was forbidden. And uh, you were lucky if you only got fired. Many people were sent to the concentration camps and several were condemned to death, in particular Vavilov, you know, a very uh, eminent uh, 
seed biologists uh, and crop biologists in the Soviet Union was sentenced to death for, of all things, teaching uh, Mendelian economic, uh, Mendelian heredity. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, science, when, when politics uh, weighs in, can get out of control very, very rapidly. And uh, that's been demonstrated many times in, in uh, human history. Uh, e even before there was the sort of science that we understand today. Uh, I, I don't know, it, it reminds me, I, I'm a big fan of the, of the Old Testament, but it reminds me a little bit about poor Elijah, you know, and the priests of Baal, you know. So <laughs> to me, I, I look at all the, some of the worst of the uh, climate uh, alarmists and, the, and they're just like the priests of Baal, you know, they, uh, it's not warming up, so they dance around and they cut themselves and they bleed, you know, and, uh, and, and still the climate doesn't warm. And um, so this has been going on for, for many, many millennia, you know, that uh, you get... But, but then how is it passing peer review and, you know, the scientific directors of NSF and bodies like that, which are, you know, supposed to be the gatekeepers. This is to me, this is my, a personal question for me, because this is, you know, uh, 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 honestly, it's terrifying. It's, it's, it's frightening in a way. Well, uh, I don't think there is a, are, are any clear gatekeepers for science. And I personally wouldn't want a gatekeeper for science. But, no, uh, but, you know, peer review is supposed to be the gatekeeper, but, you know, that process obviously fails. Yeah, well, What's we, the talk, way we, we, we talked about eugenics. Uh, they had peer-reviewed journals on eugenics, and um, it was uh, all nonsense, you know, but it was peer-reviewed nonsense. So this is not unusual, you know, it's happened before. <laughs> You know, lots of people, the less yeah, you should biology, not lose hope. Okay. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm not, so I'm not gonna lose hope. That, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, another question. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, so a few people uh, asked me to, to say, to, to explain, uh, for you to explain again, why is there inversion in the poles? where CO2 uh, uh, actually acts as a cooler, as an inverse uh, okay. uh, greenhouse gas. Would you Good, okay. that? I'd be happy okay? to say a little bit about that. You know, okay. This is a mashup of politics and science, and, and this is wonderful because you, yeah. you're, you, you, you're, <laughs> your appearance is so wide, we're going to use it as much as we can. Well, I'd, ra I'd rather talk about the science, and so I'm happy to talk about the polls. And, you know... Uh, when there winter comes at the South Pole, uh, you know, it, it's really quite harsh. And uh, the, uh, it's six months long, you know, that it's dark for six months. And so when the sun goes down, the uh, ice uh, continues to radiate heat into cold space. And so the ice temperature gets colder and colder and colder. Uh, and, um, but it, it doesn't, communicate this cold surface temperature very well to the air above it. So before long, uh, you've got very cold ice, you've got very cold air a kilometer or two above the ice that's in contact with the ice, and it can't mix with the air above because it's heavy. So as the winter goes on in the South Pole, you've got this layer of warm air floating above the very cold air, heavy cold air below. So it's, it's a very strong inversion, so the, the air doesn't mix. And so, um, so the uh, radiation from the surface is, is quite small because it's so cold and it gets smaller and smaller as the winter goes on. But the radiation above from the warm air in the inversion layer, you know, is still just as good as ever. It, it cools, but not as rapidly because, you know, CO2 and is not that potent a radiator and there's not that much of it and there's practically no water left in the south pole so the absence of water in the air helps to make this inversion happen and keep it stable and so th this combination means that th there are a, a month or two in the south pole where you've got much warmer air above than at the surface 
And then if you add CO2, then the air above can radiate even more abundantly to space. <laughs> and so the radiation to space increases as you add CO2 rather than decreases as it does over most of the rest of the world. So it's the only part where when you look down, instead of seeing a CO2 absorption band, you know, where there's less radiation, you look down and you see a CO2 absorb emission band. So you see the strong band of CO2 radiation coming up. There's more CO2 being radiated than there is surface radiation coming up. You see this clearly from satellites. It's, it's a very striking effect. And uh, so it's, there's an inverse greenhouse effect there. It's the same thing I mentioned that if you have the greenhouse effect depends on the atmosphere being uh, non-isothermal. So if, if the atmosphere temperature is decreasing as you go up, greenhouse gas will warm. If the temperature, temperature goes up, you know, like with an inversion, then greenhouse gas is cool, right? So, uh, so the temperature profile is very, very important and, and very few people understand that, <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, it's quite, quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so, um, we have a few more questions if you still have the... the yeah, sure, okay. The, yes, so uh, one question that came up. Um, what do you think are the biggest environmental challenges that we are facing? We, as humanity or as local communities or, or whatever that we stands for, how do you see these, these issues? Well, I, I think at some deep level, uh, the, the most important issue is, is how to give people a, a meaningful life. You know, I, I think people have an inborn uh, need to want to live a meaningful life. Uh, and uh, it's harder and harder to do that because uh, uh, more and more uh, jobs can be done by machinery and by computer and, and there's less you can do as, as an individual to, to feel like you're contributing to the world, contributing to society. You know, a hundred years ago, you know, kids could you know, help the family on the farm or they, they could help in the shop and uh, those opportunities to do something meaningful where you feel like you're doing something worthwhile uh, are, are fewer and fewer. So I think one thing that would be enormously helpful is to figure out some way to give every person in the world, especially young people, a meaningful life. So if I were a politician, I would be thinking hard, how do we do that? You know, I, you know, maybe there's not a single way to do it. You know, maybe there are lots of ways to do it. But I think, for example, if you look at uh, healthy religious communities, um, I think the young people uh, are happier and feel more fulfilled uh, there than in uh, sort of value-free secular societies. You know, I'm, I'm a secularist myself, you know, but I, I, I worry about the, the lack of uh, uh, meaning, you know, in a purely secular life. I, I think people need meaning in their life. So, and, and I regard that as an environmental problem too, you know, because the, you know, the biggest problem you've That's a very unique life... perspective. <laughs> What's that? It's a very unique perspective. Yeah. On, on, on. Well, your, your biggest, look, the biggest problem you face in life is not the environment, it's other people. So our environment is the other people around us. And uh, so that's what we should be working on uh, is to uh, make the human environment, meaning other people, work better with each other, you know, and, and get rid of some of this uh, age old wickedness that has not come from the environment, it's come from humans, right? <laughs> So that, that would be my number one priority. You know, number two, you know, I think there's lots we can do to uh, uh, clean up uh, real pollution. Uh, so I'm completely in favor of uh, pollution controls on coal plants, on, you know, on, uh, oil plants and uh, uh, sensible waste disposal. You know, conserving open land, I'm all for that. You know, I don't like you know, I, I don't want to cut down everything in the Amazon or even in my backyard. <laughs> so, so there are these obvious things that we should do. Everyone should want to do that. Uh, 
but they pale in, in connection. They, they really are of second order compared to the, the human environment, which I think is by far the most important. Wow, that, that's really uh, uh, an interesting perspective because typically when people, when people are asked what's the most important environmental problem, they say pollution or water pollution or, or you know, the lack of area for wildlife and things like that. But this is really, to me, uh, um, quite demonstrative of the humanistic approach to environmentalism. Yeah. I mean, that you cannot separate the humans from the environment. And when you do that, you are, you're, well, you're immediately taking the environmental side. This is a, a kind of misanthropy. Mm -hmm. You know, the same well, humans are a problem to the earth. And, mm -hmm. and this is something we've seen a, 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 all throughout, you know, these giant propaganda a campaigns on, on climate. They say, oh, how dare you talk about economics and welfare of, and, and growth when, you know, the... the the, the world is burning or so on and so forth. So you're taking really a, a, a singularly humanistic approach to this, which is very, to me, it's very beautiful. It's very appealing and it's very mm -hmm. non-standard. I think that's, uh, that's the first time that I heard someone say that our top priority environmental problem is, a, a, you know, human satisfaction. But of course, it also correlates with the fact that wealthier uh, countries have a better environment, you know, in, in standard parameters, cleaner air, cleaner water, and things like that, which, which is well yeah. correlated, you know, because the standard of living, uh, uh, in a way, dictates the welfare of people, and they have time to worry about the environment, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. You so, may, uh... May I add something to this? Yes, and please, please, yeah, God, of course. Yeah, uh, the point is that when we think about environment, we tend to automatically omit human being out of it. So we always think about preserving the nature as it was without human. And, and uh, this is part of the value of what we heard now, is that we should consider human life as a major part of the environment and actually the most important for human. And uh, this is the perspective that you, we should gain. Uh, and we lost it somewhere along the way with anti-human philosophy and uh, development uh, that took a uh, human out of the equation. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have time for a few more questions. So uh, Zev is asking, is it true that the globe is actually getting greener uh, uh, because of CO2? Is it are there evidence for that? Yes, there, there's very good, you know, hard evidence for that in various areas. One is, uh, it's clear forests are growing faster because if you, you go to places like Finland, which makes its living from uh, forests, uh, forest yields are going up. And that's because of more CO2, mostly because uh, any plant, uh, if you put it in higher levels of CO2, grows better. There are a number of reasons for that. The, the two most important are it uh, is more resistant to drought, and, and drought is the big problem for most of agriculture. And, and secondly, it, it's uh, less harmed by uh, um, photorespiration, which is a issue maybe I won't talk about right now, but it, it's important for most plants. And uh, the other way you can tell that it's greening is from satellite uh, pictures of uh, chlorophyll. And since we're amongst mostly scientific friends there, uh, it's quite interesting how they measure chlorophyll from, from satellites. It, turns out it, it's based on the fact that chlorophyll uh, fluoresces in sunlight. It's one of the few things on the Earth's surface that fluoresces. And so 99% of the light that chlorophyll absorbs goes into heat or to chemical energy or, or various other things that 
are needed for life, but 1% is uh, converted into near infrared radiation and re radiated out of the leaf. So this is light out and, you know, 700 nanometers, 800 nanometers, you know, it's the near infrared. And mm -hmm. uh, so if you could detect that uh, fluorescence, uh, you would know how much uh, chlorophyll there is. And the problem is there's a lot of sunlight there also, you know, sun is very, very bright at 700 and 800 nanometers. So you can't see it because of the glare of the sun. So the, the clever trick, which I've always admired is some smart person figured out, you should look in the Fraunhofer lines of the sun because uh, the Fraunhofer lines are nice and dark and uh, that's where the fluorescence will show up. So the way they measure it is they look at the strong Fraunhofer lines in the near infrared and they see them filling in as a result of the uh, chlorophyll fluorescence. And if you do that, you can show that the earth has been steadily greening, especially in drier areas, you know, Western Australia, Western United States, uh, Western India. And that's because of this uh, drought resistance that you get with more CO2. Again, that's very simple physics that the leaf in order to get the CO2 to grow has to have little holes in it to let the CO2 diffuse in from the air. And uh, that same hole lets water diffuse out, you know, diffusion goes both ways. And the typical vapor pressure of water in a leaf is uh, much higher than the partial pressure of CO2 in the outside air. So you lose 50 water molecules, 100 water molecules for every CO2 that diffuses in. And so that, that's why it takes typically uh, 100 grams of water to make a gram of carbohydrate in a leaf. You know, it, it's because you're losing so much in this photosynthetic leaf. So uh, plants have been coping with fluctuating CO2 levels uh, since they first evolved. You know, CO2 levels have always gone up and down. And so they have very uh, subtle feedback mechanisms built into their growth. And if they are growing with more CO2, they simply grow a leaf with fewer holes in it. And, and so if you compare leaves today, I'll say for a cotton plant with those that were collected 100 years ago in a herbarium in a museum, today's cotton has fewer holes in it than the one 100 years ago. And so 100 years ago, you needed more water because the leaf was leaking more than it is today. So that uh, resistance to aridity is by far the most important benefit. But the, the, the secondary one I mentioned, the uh, resistance to photorespiration is also important. But the earth is definitely greeny. Um, okay, so, uh, um, <clears throat> so I think um, one last question uh, that I have to, to, and then we will sum her up. So I would like to ask, what advice would you give us at the Israeli Forum for Rational Environmentalism as we try to, to push forward these ideas? I mean, you have a long, long uh, history and experience in, in battling, you know, flawed science and pseudoscience and propaganda science. And can you give us some helpful uh, tips or uh, advice as to how to approach these issues to the general public, and but not only, also to 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 other to fellow scientists, which are you know telling us you know nothing about climate science. Why are you dwelling on these things? Yes, well, uh, th those are very good questions, and uh, I, I ask myself the same questions all the time. Um, I think. Uh, the most important audience is probably the uh, general public and uh, because they, they are less equipped to resist the propaganda. And uh, so anything you can do to uh, talk to the average person and, and explain them in, to them in terms that they can understand that there is not an emergency uh, and that there are actually benefits to more CO2 it's hard to do because the media won't help. You know, it's, it's hard to get out to the, to the general public. With respect to fellow scientists, um, 
that's a really hard one. You know, uh, I, I find my Princeton colleagues, at least in physics, are, are uh, courteous to me. They, the, the people who have grants that depend on climate alarmism hate me, but that's not many. So I, I don't worry about that. Uh, I, I think uh, w with our scientific community, the, we've got a problem that uh, scientists have always felt, uh, academics have felt underappreciated, especially in America. You know, you don't get much respect as an academic in America and you never have. It's, it's much worse than say in Europe or maybe Israel too. And so there's this feeling uh, in the academic community of us versus them. You know, there's uh, what Hillary Clinton calls a basket of deplorables out there who don't, you know, bow down and worship to academics. And uh, so because of that resentment by our own community, it's very, very hard for them to um, uh, support us, you know, to try and be rational about uh, rational about environmentalism when that's what the general public wants. The general public does not want to be impoverished. They don't want to lose their freedoms and, uh, you know, to uh, fight this imaginary, what they, many of them think is an imaginary threat. And uh, so that, that's a threat to uh, Academics, I, didn't I tell you what's true? How, how dare you question what I've said? You know, I'm much better than you. I, I understand these things far better than you could ever understand them. And you shouldn't question me. So that, that's, uh, that's a, a, a real problem that we have. It's a, you know, I, you think I'm kidding, but it's, it's really there. And, uh, so. <laughs> My God. Uh, 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 so uh, I have to say that I was planning to stop here, but if, but I'm boomed from people uh, uh, in, in the chat and on WhatsApp who are eager to ask a, a question. So would you mind staying with us a little longer? Would that be okay? A, a, a little bit longer. I'm, I'm getting a little tired, but I, a little bit longer is okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so so Zev, you wanted to ask a question? Another question? Um, thank One you, last Dr. Question. Would that be okay? Yeah, it's okay. You hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harper, for really the inviting talk. Um, on the same note of the of, of your words, uh, I would like to ask you about your views on the real catastrophe, because we agree that the, the environmental catastrophe is not there, but. Uh, would you say that there is another catastrophe uh, and this is the uh, damage to the reputation of science in the eyes of the public? Um, because science is like uh, the candle uh, in the dark uh, sometimes. And uh, won't you think that uh, there's a lot of damage being done to, to science when people hear about manipulating data and political arguments in science. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Oz. That's uh, related to the comments I, I just made that um, scientists uh, like to think that they're a candle in the dark, but I, I, I believe that if you go out and ask the average person, certainly in America, whether scientists are on a pedestal, most of them don't really believe it, you know, because they've gotten so much contradictory advice, you know, take COVID, you know, no need to wear masks. And then, you know, a month or two later, everybody has to wear a mask or, you know, 20 years ago, don't eat eggs, you know, they will give you heart attacks. And then, you know, 10 years ago, oh, forget about it. We, you know, we've changed that, you know, so the public has continually seen, at least in America, contradictory advice coming out. So they simply assume that scientists are well-meaning idiots. And uh, so I don't think we have a reputation to lose in America. <laughs> we never had one to begin with. But maybe that's different. You know, I, I was surprised, for example, I spent a sabbatical year once in Germany and people were so deferential to me because I was a scientist. Uh, 
it was just amazing and uh because that's certainly not the way i get treated in america so i, I think it's different in different parts of the globe and uh so it probably will be more damaging to science in Germany, say in Japan, in places where science is revered more than it is in the United States. We have this tradition of, of contempt for education, you know, that goes back to the founding of the Republic, you know, Ichabod Crane, you know, there's this famous uh, story written in the early 1800s, but he was the equivalent of a science, you know, and he, he had a pumpkin head and he was frightened to death on Halloween, you know, and so that pretty well captured the American view for, right from the inception of our republic. <laughs> and I think it's been a healthy view. I'm glad we have it. Yeah. Okay, so so I, I, I think that we have an amazing meeting and we heard a lot about the science of CO2 in the atmosphere and uh, uh, about uh, uh, the politics and the underlying currents. And uh, here I think is a good place to stop and thank Professor Happer again for uh, 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 giving us the opportunity to ask him these questions. And, and if you have other questions, please send them to me and we'll organize a, 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 a reasonable meeting, uh, sorry, a, a letter for him and, and he will answer what he can. And I also urge everyone to hear a, a Professor Happer's talks on YouTube. They are, first of all, extremely interesting and amusing and a, a fun to watch, but beneath that you see the basis of true science and how it really should act like uh, a candle in the dark, as uh, Carl Sagan wrote. So with this, I'd like to thank you so much, Professor Happer, for uh, spending the time with us. Thank you all, and, 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 and I, I think congratulate everyone, what you're doing. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you, thank you. So uh, we'll see you live in person next time you are in Israel, once COVID allows that. Look forward to it. Okay, great. Bye. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone. And meet us on our webpage and Facebook page. Okay. Shalom v'todah, Professor Hopper. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. נשלח,אנחנו,נשלח,בהחלט,תעקבו אחרי הבלוג הירוק,אנחנו נעלה לשם את ההקלטה,ונשים בכל הערוצים,תודה רבה גם לכל מי ששאלו שאלות,יש ל